Okay, we the the Torah study today is Ki Tevo and Netzavim, and it begins in uh, Deuteronomy twenty six one, and we're going to go all the way to Deuteronomy thirty <coughs> twenty. Okay, so it's a it's a long ways. We'll get talking, and if you have questions or or comments, uh, let Peggy know. All of you that are in the in the chat room, and she'll just uh, let you jump right in. Uh, I don't have my chat on, so you've got yours, right, Peggy Sue? Okay. All right. So um, you know we'll we'll get we'll get started now. And if you could join me in the blessing over the reading of the Torah. Baruch Atah Donai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bakar Benu Mikol Hamin Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Donai Noten Ha Torah Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us His Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read uh, verses. Uh, I'll start in verse 1 of uh, chapter 26. If you want to read along with me. Then it shall be when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance and you possess it and live in it that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you bring in from your land that the Lord your God gives you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I declare this day to the Lord my God that I have entered the land which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. You shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, but there he became a great, mighty, and populous nation. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with, the sign, with signs and wonders. And he has brought us to this place and has given us this land a land flowing with milk and honey. Join me now as we uh, sing the blessing after the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher natan lanu Torah timet Vechai olam natavotekanu Baruch atah Adonai Noten ha Torah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. 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 You know, there is so much more. We just read, what, a, a, a few paragraphs in 26, and this goes all the way to chapter uh, 30, all of chapter 30. So there is a whole lot in there, and uh, I don't know how it went last week, but were you able to cover two chapters? Uh, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that's exactly it. it it's like kind of, you know, uh, uh, I'm, it's, it's just, there's just so much there, especially when you got a lot of different information there in front of you, not, not just uh, reading from the from the Bible or from Torah, but uh, you know there's just so much there. Uh, okay, we're going to get started in Ki Tavo. Okay, Ki Tavo is Hebrew for when you enter, and that is your first fill-in. Ki Tavo means when you enter. 
And these are the second and the third words in the parasha. In this Torah portion, Moses uh, instructs the Israelites regarding the first fruit offering. Uh, this week's parasha, Kitavo, includes in it a description of how the people are to live and obey God. You know, once they settle in the land. Right now, uh, they are... Uh, they are still in the land of Moab. They are east of the Jordan. So they still have not. But right here, there's many who believe that it's, it's right. Well, the next, uh, the next uh, parasha is the last day of Moses' life. And he, there's still three more uh, Torah portions after that. But they believe that all of this is happening now right at the end of, of Moses' life. He is getting ready to go to be with his ancestors, and then the people are going to move across the Jordan into the Promised Land. Moses commands them to place in a basket the first fruits of their harvest and to present them to the priest at the temple. While doing so, they are to recite a, you may call it a, a, a story, a, a prayer, a formula. <clears throat> you know, recalling that they were slaves in Egypt, uh, freed by God, gi given the land whose first fruits they are now going, going to enjoy. They are to set aside a tenth part of their harvest for the Levites, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Moses tells the Israelites that they are to keep all of God's commandments. You see, there is so much in here. In a nutshell, we can get through this in five minutes. But when you, <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> all of us nuts, <laughs> oh, wing nuts. <laughs> okay, in verses one and two, we read, uh, "When you have entered the land, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and have taken possession of it and settled in it." It says, "Take some of the first fruits of all that." You, that you produce from the soil of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And he, they are instructed, place them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You know, things change up. And I wonder if today it's, uh, don't put it in a basket, put it in a box and bring it before the Lord, you know. <laughs> put it in an envelope, you know. There's different ways that you can give an offering. The Lord is giving his children a land to dwell in, and he alone will, he says, he will choose the place where he will be worshipped and honored. You know, in fact, one of the first commandments, uh, when they enter the land, they're going to have to plant crops, or they're going to have to cultivate and uh, and. Uh, the crops that they are about to, you know, that have already been planted. But either way, they are going to need to plant. You know, I don't think, I think the fruits of the tree, you can't even eat of it till, what is it, the, the fourth year? If, I think you, it, if you plant it. If you plant it. If yeah. you plant it, yeah, you They're can't. They're occupying the land that's already They're out, yeah. developed. Yeah, you know, but, but still, if they were going to plant something, uh, uh, so they, three years without eating, and then you could eat it in the fourth year, right. which actually makes it a four-year wait. That you know, well, makes it a four-year wait, exactly. But but uh, Pastor Bruce is right, and Pastor Paul, uh, that they're occupying a land where a lot of this is already in place. But it's in place because the Lord made sure it was in place. Uh, and, and it says... Uh, like I said, uh, and then they will see just how much God is going to take care of them. And after all the produce of the ground had ripened, they are to honor him who, honor the person who has provided it, and that is our Lord. Uh, they are to bring him their first fruits. So this Torah portion begins with the commandment regarding the first fruits. In Hebrew, the word bikarim means first fruits. And we have uh, covered this many times throughout the years. Uh, so in letter A, God is providing the Israel, 
God is providing, the Israelites are responding. And in, le in number one, the people are to bring their first fruits, bickering, to the place that God chooses. You know, they got in trouble many years, many years later. Uh, they're going to get in trouble because they decided to uh, do things their way. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, was it the tribe in the northern territories decided, hey, it's too far to walk to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, you know, we're just going to build an altar up here in the north. Well, that isn't where God chose uh, his name to dwell. His, uh, that wasn't where his temple or his tabernacle uh, we just can't pick and choose. It's like where he chooses, you know, uh, especially during that time. Go ahead. Oh, Pastor Paul, why don't we get one of the mics and put it on the far table? Okay. Since uh, Maria isn't yeah, here today. Not here. Maria's not here. <laughs> it's all right. We have Deanna here. That's true. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I can cause as much trouble as they do. <laughs> or more. Yeah. Or more. You know, one of the things that we overlook, but we shouldn't, this is the first time that God is calling Israel to be farmers. Yeah. They were shepherds. They were not farmers. Even when they were in Egypt, they were shepherds. Yeah. And so they're in the wilderness. They're still shepherds. And now they're crossing over, and he says, now... I want you to start farming. Right. That, that's a whole different lifestyle, yeah. if you think about it. Because when you change, and that's an interesting thing to consider, when you change lifestyles, that means you are learning a whole different way of living, and your experiences are not the same as raising animals. Right. You know, I mean... So, I mean, it, it corresponds with us when we come to faith yeah. and we cross over yeah. because we have yeah. a whole different lifestyle that begins. Amen. Amen. You know, I was, talk, I was speaking to uh, one of the gals here in our congregation, and she was telling us about how roughly 10 years ago she, was, uh, she belonged to a, another congregation, or, and there was a gentleman there that uh, moved out into uh, the high desert up near the, the foothills, and he just started planting and building sukkahs and all this. And she said, and she goes, and I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing this for? He says, I don't know. He says, I was told to do this, to, mm -hmm. to get ready. She says, so he's planted all these fields, uh, plant, made these homes, these, these dwellings. And she said, but now, now here it is 10 years later with everything that's going on, you know, she goes, I don't know. She goes, I could only speculate that, you know, he's getting things ready for something that's coming down. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, have any of you read, Peggy was sharing with me about, uh, there was a person that many years ago said that eventually 70% of the people will be living in only 13 states. Hmm. And, uh, and then they, I mean, she looked into it, and then he, today now another person's coming out and saying, what was it? No, 67, uh, roughly. 67 percent, which was close to the 70 percent. 67 percent, which is close to the 70 percent, and they said yes, that they agreed upon it, that eventually majority of the people are going to be living, within the United States, yeah, with, well, the majority of the people are going to be living in roughly 13 states. And I said, then she says, by 2040, by 2040, you know, and, and then uh, what they said was, uh, uh, then she said, well, what state do you think they would be? And I said, I, I know California. And she goes, yep. I said, I know New York, yep. And I know Texas, yep. And Florida, that was one of them. Uh, Pennsylvania was one of them. Illinois, Michigan, there was a few like that. But th that's what they're saying, that majority of the population is going to be congregated into 13 states. You know, something, and that was by 2040, you know. Uh, go ahead, Gary. 
uh, right here. One of the strategies of Sun Tzu was that if he knew the strategy or plans of his enemy, he would win every single time. Mm -hmm. What is what's his face doing buying up all the farmland across the United States? Yeah. Yeah. When you think of COVID, the Delta variant, the mandatory vaccines that are from government, military, travel, it's just in, encroaching left and right. Yes. The printing of fiat cash and the inflation is what, 30, 40% heading towards a financial collapse. I mean, you can see all these things coming. Right. And the enemy knows what it's doing and it's not even bothering trying to hide it anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And for the most part, we as a body are doing nothing. Yeah. We can see it coming, but are we getting ready for it? Are we preparing for it? No. And my question is why? You know, the spiritual warfare is upon us already, and we're still... Hibernating. Well, <laughs> you don't prepare for war after it's already begun. Yeah. And as, as, a, as a watchman, I've been saying all along, yeah. something's coming and it's getting very, very close. With what you were saying, we're all saying it. We can see the writing on the wall. It is coming. Yeah. Okay, you talk about your friend. For some reason, three, four years ago, God gave us land. We planted trees. Why? I don't know. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I was sharing earlier before the Torah study that my daughter had to uh, uh, quit her job because they, she is required to get the vaccination. And so, you know, and uh, <clears throat> otherwise they told her the other alternative was for her to go off the mountain to get tested on her dime, you know, once and a once a week, week. So, she could work. so she could work. So she said, "Yeah." So I mean, the, the vision I'm getting is of three guys who refused to bow. Yeah. And ended up in a lion's den over it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, that's where we're headed. Do we have that mindset? This this whole everything yeah. we're talking about coming out of Egypt. Yeah. That's the easy part for God. The hard part is getting the Egypt out of us. Yeah. yeah. And I think we're sorely lacking on that part. Yep. No, that's a good point. Very good point. Okay, in verses, like I said, verses 1 and 2 that we read, <clears throat> the Lord is giving his children a land uh, to dwell in, and he alone will choose the place where, you know, he'll be worshipped and honored. Uh, you know, uh, the Torah portion, like I said, begins with uh, the giving of the first fruits, the bikurim. Okay? And what this would be is this would be the first ripened produce uh, of what each family is growing. It, it, it's interesting that Pastor Paul was sharing that, you know, this is, this is going to be new for a lot of people. The, you know, taking care of crops, you know, because... To that, at, at, at this point, the Lord is still dropping manna down. They haven't entered the land yet. So in the morning, all they got to do is open up their tent and gather in every, you know, all that they need for, for that day. Uh, well, once they, once they cross over, uh, there's no more manna. You know, and now they've got to uh, take care of themselves. And... Uh, you know, I would imagine in Egypt, if there was any farmers in the group, it was very, it wasn't a, a whole lot. Because like you said, they were all, you know, they all took care of the, the sheep and, uh, and you know, so, but now they're going to have to take care of everything, you know, even build their homes. And yes, they took over some of the, the areas uh, that, that they conquered, 
but uh, there was a lot of places where they had to just destroy everything because of the idleness that the idol worship that was going on and then they had to build things up on their own pastor paul well the lord said that even the type of farming was going to be completely different than egypt mm -hmm. in egypt you got to water the crops with your foot that was using the pump that they had for irrigation where where they're going yeah. god says i'm going to provide the rain yeah you know I'm going to provide that, but you're going to have to do the cultivation. Right. So, I mean, it, it's a very similar thing, but it's completely different. You know, but there's still work involved. You know, the Lord is... It's all work. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord's going to do uh, his part, but, you know, we've got to do our part. You know, and, it, and things, things haven't changed. You know, it's a good practice today that when God prospers us, uh, that we should show our appreciation by returning a portion back to him or bringing a, a portion in in the form of an offering. Uh, we should never forget, it, it, and the word even tells us we should never forget the stranger who is in need, okay? The fatherless, the widow, uh, uh, and also those who serve in the congregation. You know, he, here it talks about the Levites, you know, the, to bring an offering uh, for the Levites. You know, the first fruit offering, re, re, uh, what it's speaking about here, it's not a tithe, okay? It's not, uh, it's not going to be part of the tithe. It can be given uh, to, as charity or, you know, to help the poor to, as a gift. And the other thing is, there is no requirement of how much. He said, fill up the basket. I would imagine that there was probably those that would uh, fill the basket to overflowing or, 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 or a big basket, something where two may have to carry. Um, or, or maybe it was a smaller basket. There was no requirement. It said, you know, bring your first fruit offering, you know. And uh, <clears throat> let me see where I'm at here. Okay, and then they, uh, this all began after the Israelites entered the promised land. So if the tabernacle was stationed with the people as they travel, that's where the offering would be taken, okay? Uh, when the tabernacle, tabernacle was at Shiloh, and it was at Shiloh for a long time, uh, the people would have to travel to Shiloh to bring their, uh, their first fruit offering. You know, I was thinking about it. You know, I think Shiloh was probably, when you think about the land of Israel, I think Shiloh was in a more central location than uh, Jerusalem, you know, around. yeah, it would have been, you know, it's like, it's like a, an equal distance, you know, but, uh, um, but God chooses where he's going to be honored, you know, and, and he was honored uh, in, in Shiloh, okay, when the tabernacle finally settled in uh, Jerusalem, then that was where the people were to take their bickering, their, their first fruits, it was like I, you know, it was always where God chose. In ancient times, the farmers or the family would gather together in the village, and I got this out of the the Mishnah, that they would gather in the village and they would set out uh, to go up to Jerusalem. In fact, the Mishnah records that throughout Israel, each that in each town, the people would gather together the night before, and they would sleep in the open air. And then the next day, the leader of the, of the village would uh, shout, Arise and let's go up to Zion, to the house of the Lord. And these words are written in Jeremiah 31.5. Okay, those who were near Jerusalem, then you're wondering, uh, what did they bring? Well, those that were near Jer Jerusalem would bring fresh fruit. They would bring fresh figs and grapes and, and olives and, you know, uh, but then those who lived out in the outskirts, like in the Northern Territory, uh, they would bring dried figs and raisins. You know, they would bring uh, the olive oil that it, it's already been pressed and, uh, you know, that would be the, the first, their first fruit offering. But the offerings were always from the seven uh, species, which are wheat, barley, figs, grapes, pomegranates, dates, and olives. 
And we've covered this before in previous uh, parashahs. You know, the, this is an, an, a, they, there is an abundance of all of these in, uh, in Israel. One thing I don't think we did when we were there, uh, we never ran into a ripe uh, pomegranate because we were always there, you know, before the season that the pomegranates would, uh, would be ripe, ripened. But, uh, I, you know, Peggy and I, we love pomegranates. Yeah. We do, you know, you know, we just love taking all of them out, put them in a bowl, yeah, put a little, <laughs> put a little, sugar and water on it or whatever and and it's uh it's something i guess peggy had been doing for years and probably learned that from her parents and then we picked it up the me and the kids and my kids when we used to go to the market and they had pomegranates pomegranates you know <laughs> and we'd grab them and take them home and and even now even the grandkids would say grandma can you cut this and you know okay so she's the one who who gets it already but but that's one thing I wanted to do I wanted to find one in Israel and see you know how big and how ripe and how sweet they were but we never got the opportunity the Mishnah speaks of an awesome of an awesome spectacle that this was an awesome time they would deck out the ox that would be pulling the cart. And what the people would do is they'd put all their first fruits offering on that cart. And, uh, and the ox would have like, like uh, would be decked out in like gold and uh, or a, a wreath uh, on its head. And, you know, and they just made it such a big thing. And it says that in the Mishnah that someone would play the flute. So if you're wondering why when we uh, go to Sukkot and we have our uh, procession, our processional, uh, we always have somebody playing the flute. You know? It's always been Sheila. What's that? I said it's always been Sheila. It was Sheila and then it was Christy. Now we, now we need a flute player. Yeah, yeah. Sharon? Oh, I saw. I thought you were raising your hand. I thought you were volunteering to play the flute. <laughs> you wouldn't like that. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, and they said that this would be played. Now imagine this. Yeah, imagine this. You know, if you're in the northern territory, coming all the way and going up to Jerusalem, and all that time, you know, it's like a caravan just going. And as they were going through other towns, people would come out and watch this, and then those from that town would join in, and uh, and they would gather. So what may have started as maybe uh, forty or fifty families or something like that, all of a sudden would grow to a thousand families just walking the road going up to Jerusalem. I mean that had to be an, an awesome sight to see. So when they arrived at the Temple Mount, they would grab their baskets and place, and place they would take them off the cart. It says that they would grab their baskets off the cart, place them on their shoulders, uh, and, and then they would bring their first fruits up to the temple. Then we are told that both, then we are told that both the person offering the first fruit and the priest together would wave the basket. You know, they would wave the basket. And the Torah tells us, in fact, we read, it, uh, we read it today, that the person who brought the offering would then have to recite. And this is what they recited. And that's in, uh, in Deuteronomy 26, 5. My father was a wandering Aramean. And he went down to Egypt and recited, resided there. Few in number, but there he became a great, mighty, and populous uh, nation. And the Egyptians treated us badly and oppressed us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our wrenched condition, our trouble, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with great terror and the signs and wonders. And he, and he has brought us to this place 
and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first of the produce of the ground which you, Lord, has, have given me. Would you call this a prayer? You know, there are many who would. Uh, would you just say that you're telling a story? You know, or this is just a, a, a formula of what to say. I, I would imagine that today our stories would be different for, for many of us. Uh, but this is recorded in Torah, and the, and, the, and the Israelites are instructed to say these words. Uh, we, can, we can also find the same story. If, and if this sounds familiar, it's because it is. Uh, we find the same story at the Passover Seder. At the Passover Seder, <clears throat> it's all about remembering our history. Uh, Every time you do the first fruits, you remember your history. Your history. That, that's right. You know, and uh, here in Deuteronomy 26.5, uh, uh, we, uh, we can divide this into four sections. Uh, so, uh, in, let, let me do a fill-in. Number two, each person recites their history and thanks God. Recites is the fill-in. And then in letter B, there are four sections to this prayer or story. Okay, we, we can divide this, like I said, into four areas uh, or sections where, uh, where the first one would be where we came from. And think about your life, where you came from. Okay, uh, and, number, and then and number, the second one would be where you have been. You know, where you came from and where you have been might be two different, uh, different things. You know, the Lord has taken us out of a lot of uh, predicaments and uh, <laughs> probably to, you know, something we caused on our own, but, but still, you know, we've been somewhere. Uh, then the third one is, is why you are here. Why have you come here uh, before the Lord? And the fourth one would, would be your offering. So in, le in number one, where we, where, where we come from, where we've been, why am I here, and my offering. To answer the first question, where we came from, Rashi says that the Aramean is Laban. He says that they're speaking, he felt that they're talking about Laban. Laban, uh, he wasn't really kind to, uh, to uh, Jacob. Laban was an uh, idol worshiper, you know. Um, and, but Rashi says that he feels that it's Laban. Rashbam, the grandson of Rashi, uh, felt it was Abraham since he was born and raised in the most eastern part uh, of Aram. Uh, he felt that it was Abraham, and Abraham did go down to Egypt, you know. But still, there's a third stud. Uh, Ezra, the Torah commentator from, uh, from about the 1100s, uh, he felt that it referred to Jacob who went down to Egypt, few in numbers, and grew to become a great nation. You know, and I think the latter two, you can debate uh, uh, who the Aramean is. Uh, I, I tend to go with Rashbam. I think it's, it's Abraham, myself. Yeah, I do, because where that... Use, use the microphone, oh, share it. Yeah, where Abraham Abram came from right. was Aram. Yeah. That was the territory name. So when we say he's a wandering uh, Arm Aramia, I don't yeah. know how to say that word. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> then we identify where he came from, and that's what part of Abraham was. Yeah. So, well, Ur, what, it, what does it say, Ur of the Chaldeans? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, the, the, I think the major point here is this is one thing we, we, this is one of the few places where we have instructions for the individual 
Yes. But it's about yes. an individual and not about the whole group. Right. Right. And so we have to, we're identifying ourselves with that situation personally. In other words, we started at nothing. Right. And this is what God has done for us. Yeah. You know, we do, it's our story. Yeah. I started here as whatever. Yeah. And by grace of God, I'm where I am today. Not that right. I'm, you know, here, but I'm certainly far from yeah. where I was. You know, we have to be uh, not because we do want more for ourselves, for our family. We always want more for our children. Uh, but we, we, you know, we have to be satisfied. The Lord has, we all have a story. You know, with me, uh, you know, I was raised in, uh, in, in housing projects. That is where my family lived. You know, and if you don't think it's uh, rough growing up like in a ghetto area in housing projects, you know, it is. But uh, I really feel, in looking back, that I was protected, you know. And, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot there. And then, uh, you know, it, it wasn't until we were both about 28 years old that we really made a commitment to the Lord, you know. And, and things led one thing to another. And this is where, I'm, where we are at today. And... and I'm blessed, you know, and I think we have to uh, all realize how blessed we are, yes. you know. Go ahead, Sharon. Well, you were saying um, that, you know, we've read this before and you mentioned Abraham and, and Laban and Jacob. But, you know, I think this is one of God's primary ways of teaching us that he has something he wants to say and he repeats it. Yes. It's not just once and that's it. Yep. Um, it, he repeats it, he repeats it, he repeats it um, in different stories, in different people's lives. Um, and he's trying to get across, you know, a much deeper point, you yeah. know, that, that and that, it's kind of neat the way he teaches. Um, it's not like the letter of the law, but it's, it is the spirit. Uh, yes. of the story. What is he saying? What's, yep. what's he teaching? Yeah. yeah. And you're absolutely right. And, and what the Lord is showing us is something that's contrary to what is going on today. He is showing us, don't forget your history. Yes. This is where you came from. You know, and yet today we live in a society that uh, there's a lot of people out there that they want to rewrite history. They want to rewrite history without God. Rewrite history. Uh, we're talking about, uh, I was mentioning to Tila today about uh, she went to go see the Flight 93, Flight 93 Memorial. Yeah. And like I told her, those are heroes. Mm -hmm. those, those are people that should be honored, but yet we live in a, in a, a country now that they want to rewrite things. And I would imagine that they would probably even want to tear down that memorial. Yeah, you know, um, it was really it was really something because when we were standing there, and I got very emotional, and and I'm not an emotional person, but I got very emotional, and I could hear the Holy Spirit saying, "History shows you my faithfulness," Amen. because with all of that that went on, there was a lot that was prevented, and yet when we go there, you can't help but just getting involved with the spirit of what God was doing. Amen. Uh, his faithfulness. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, and I think, uh, you know, Sharon, you hit it, and it's, uh, you know, there is just so much here that God is telling us, you know, and what we're going to do even in the next uh, uh, parashah, you know, there's some things that the Lord makes known to us. Yeah, there are things that are hidden from us, mm -hmm. but there is so much that has been made known to us, that's what should be taking all of our time. We shouldn't be spending time on, uh, on when is the second coming? Oh, I calculated it, and it's at, you know, this certain time, and, you know, it's going to happen when it happens, you know. So, uh, let's see. Whoever, you know, but on this, whoever it's referring to, if it's Jacob, if it's Abraham or uh, Laban, um, you know, we are to remember uh, our history, the history of the people. 
I, like I said, I myself lean on that it's, that it's Abraham. The second section is where you've been, okay? They were in Egypt, and they were treated harshly. You know, it was God and only God who delivered them out of Egypt. Uh, you might want to give credit to Moses, but no, it was God who took the people out of Egypt. Uh, and then he also gave them a promise. He said, I am going to take my people to a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, and we've, we've covered this before in uh, previous parishas. You know, it wasn't supposed to be a 40-year journey. <laughs> you know, he, they were supposed to be there in no time. And even if, you, even if they didn't go by the way of the, the, the great sea, and they even went the way they went because they had to receive uh, the commandments, but even after they received the commandment, shortly after that, you know, the people wanted to send spies into the land. The Lord just wanted them to go right into the land and take it, you know. And finally here, 40 years later, the people are going to go into the land and take it. They didn't do it all because there's, there's still going to be uh, the, you know, some, some Canaanites still left in there or, or, or the enemy, but they are going in to take the land. Okay, and like uh, the father doesn't lie, and that is where the people are uh, when he gives, when this statement occurs. They're getting ready to go into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses is telling the people to honor the Lord after they've entered the land, you know, um, and I wonder about that. He had to tell the people that this is, you know, you need to honor the Lord. Would the people have forgotten to or didn't do it? I don't know, but I know at a future time, they're not going to be honoring him because they wouldn't have been exiled or, you know, taken out of the land if they did honor him. So, uh, uh, and then the, uh, the, and number four is the offering. They are to bring, and it's, it's a first fruit offering to thank the Lord for this wonderful land that he has given them. You know, even in our prayers, after we have eaten, we are to give thanks to the Lord and thank him for this good land. You know, uh, we are commanded to uh, pray for the peace of, uh, of Israel, of Jerusalem, and, uh, and we do that, you know, but we are also commanded to give thanks for the land. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, more times than not, uh, after I eat, uh, I forget, mm -hmm. you know. It's before mm -hmm. we'll say the hamotzi, you know, but it's afterwards when he says, now, now give me thanks, you know. I'm already in the car, taking off, driving down the road. And, <laughs> and the Lord is still back at the dinner table saying, what, what? <laughs> Aren't you supposed to thank me? <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, so we thank him for the harvest. You know, I, you know, we don't, one thing about uh, the pagans is, uh, you know, they always, you know, they thank their idols or they thank nature. To them, nature is a god. Mm -hmm. So they'll thank nature for this who, who was given to them like that. But we are to thank the Lord who created nature, you know, and it's God who, who provides. And, uh, you know, early on when, when uh, Joshua came into the land, uh, I would imagine that majority of the time, that they did keep the commandments because it's not until the judges when you finally read that a people arose that did not know the Lord, that did not, you know, that, uh, and it was all, and it was, and it states that it was after the death of uh, Joshua and, and all that generation, then a people arose that did not know God. So before that, if they knew God, I would imagine they kept his commandments to a T I don't know but I would say that was probably one of the only times in history that everybody was following the Lord go ahead Tila 
Well, as I was reading the last pair of shawls and then this one, it amazes me over and over and again. He keeps saying, "You've got to keep my commandments. You've got to keep my." How many yes. times do we say it? And then, and yet we today, we today, we forget yes. what commandments we're supposed to keep. You know, it's it, it, it amazes me how stupid we are, no. because they were <laughs> stupid. And now we're, you know, we have to get on board. And yeah. that, and I really, I want to say this. I think that I learned more Friday night about Alul. I was just very excited because it's we're chasing after him. So this is this is so important that people that we talk to our families, you know, this is a month that we really need to press talk to in. our families and press in and tell them how much God loves them and that we should be loving him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know that doesn't probably go with that, but I, I No, you are absolutely <laughs> right. Like Pastor Paul was sharing it uh, with the message uh, on Shabbat. You know, it, it, it's like the gates are open and the, and the king is down there with the people. Come on out and meet me, you know. And during this time, you're right. Our family needs to know that, yes. that, you know, the Lord is now is available. You know, he's with the common folks and come on out. And uh, eventually the door is going to get is going to shut, yeah. you know, and we've got 40 days. 40 days now, 30 days of, through the month of Elul, and then 10 days before Yom Kippur. Go ahead, Sharon. The fact that God wants us to remember history, yeah. you know, not only this history, but also, I think, American history. Yes. Um, and, and they've taken it out of our public schools, and I feel sorry for my grandkids because they're going to be going to public yeah. school all of a sudden, which I hate. But um, it, the thing is, the enemy is at work within our school system. Yes. And they want to take every part of God out of it. Well, they already have. Right. But then they're teaching uh, outright lies yes. to our kids, and they're not teaching them what really happened. Um, and if you read... The Declaration of Independence, and you read the Constitution, these are almost, and I say almost, holy words. Yeah. They promote freedom, um, they promote um, equality, um, there's nothing racist in them. No. Um, now, was there racism at that time? Yes, there was. Um, evil's always um, mixed in. You know, he always mixes in with, with what is good. But even, you know, when God himself created the land of um, Israel and, and made that country um, a country, um, did, uh, did the enemy come in? Oh, yeah. yeah. Big time. And we should expect that. I mean, we, we shouldn't be surprised at something like that. Right. Um, but anyway, I, I, I just pray for all the kids that are going to public schools, um, yeah. and I just, I pray that something happens soon. Amen. Amen. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I just pray that this recall, that this, this dummy is recalled, yeah. you know, because uh, we need know. that. Yeah. yeah. We just, we need a godly man running this state. We need to take California back. And you're, and that's one of the primary reasons. So we could teach our children, you know, and not let uh, the world teach them. It's funny, um, I know that, uh, that uh, Elder Carroll is gonna be teaching uh, Hebrew or, you know, <clears throat> you wouldn't believe what my uh, granddaughter calls her grandpa, you know, and nobody taught her this. She just came up with it. Our youngest granddaughter. She's only ten months old. So, so all you get out of her is the baby talk, you know, that that out of whatever. But when she sees her grandpa, she says, "Abba, Abba." <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I that's just you know. You're proud of that, I am very proud of that. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. I am. Oh, all that is, I. Smart one is. Yeah, she. I mean, I'm telling you, she. You know, Abba. You know, and um, so, you know, 
Um, it's, you know, it's just, it just, uh, you know, and who taught her that? Probably you at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, we just, Peggy and I were just, <laughs> you know. Go ahead, Pastor Paul. I, I was just going to say, you know, we, we delegated the education to institutions. Yeah. And the thing that God says in his word is the church really is supposed to eliminate the institution from out of the path that leads to God. And that means church institutions as well as secular education institutions. We, we've all done this. I, I grew up in public school, and I thought what I learned in public school was correct. And so that is in the back of my head, and I'm always thinking, you know, this is the country that was formed and founded by those who wanted religious freedom, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, that's true. But religious freedom of what sort? Because the religious freedom that when you look at our dollar bill and our capital and et cetera, et cetera, uh, they're talking about religious freedom for a God, but it's not the God of Yahweh. And so we have this mixed thing and we flip it around to whichever side we want. Right. So, yeah. you know, we really need to train our children yes. and our grandchildren from the education standpoint of what really took place. So that, because, I mean, you know, we hear things and we go, well, they're taking this, you know, God out of the uh, schools and whatever. Well, that fits into the agenda that the original thing was going on. Mm -hmm. They wanted a God, but they wanted their God, not the God. Well, I know, I know we were very fortunate you know, yeah. you, yourself, and all of us that are here of the time that we were educated. Because uh, today I would say, uh, I, I might be a little, uh, I mean, generous with my percentage, but I would say today at least about 75% of what they're teaching is incorrect. Mm -hmm. At least in our time, if there was something that was incorrect, it was less than 10%. Because I don't know about you, when I was taught the history of, uh, of the state or the geography or, or uh, the presidents, all this stuff, it, it, was, it was accurate, you know, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I really uh, enjoyed certain subjects in school, like history, you know, so I think when we learned about the war, you know, now they're going to try to teach that really the war didn't happen. Give me a break, you know. So, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I agree with you to, to, to a point there. I just think that, you know, that uh, we did, I think we were taught the best that they can do. And I, today, nah, you know, you're right. I think we need to pull our children out. Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. You know, I think the biggest difference between when we were growing up and now is uh, they were honest mistakes for the most part when we were growing yeah. up. Now it's an agenda. Yeah. Yes, and it's on the purpose. agenda is what comes out of hell. God loves the sinner, hates the sin, yeah. right? So uh, it's like, you, you can have a homosexual in your, in your congregation, that's not the worst sin in the world, according to Proverbs. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, but you cannot tolerate the agenda. We've had both here. Oh yeah. We've had practicing homosexuals and we've had people that are practicing the agenda. And it's the agenda, and right now the agenda is to pervert everything that we're learning. Whereas in, in our time it was, it was uh, not an attitude of the heart. It was, for the most part, honest mistakes. Uh, also, I was going to say, you know, um, as we approach the end, one of the things that God is going to do, and, and we see this in the whole Bible outline for life, uh, God has always been tribal. <laughs> There's no way around that. He's tribal. The whole Bible is tribal. Okay, so what that means if God calls his tribe 
or I should say tribes, because that's what we call congregations, together, and we really need to create a subculture. And I think that's, we're on the brink of that right now for those that have an ear to hear. And the subculture means you create a, an entire society that can work independently of the one that is involved with the system. Yeah. Uh, because you're not gonna beat the system. How do I know that? I've read the end of the book. Yeah. In the natural, they win. Bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do? God says, I'm going to take you through it. And, and we're going to go through it by creating a subculture. So rather than sending your kids, and we're already, Kathleen and I are already talking with people about this now. We're talking about creating a school right here for our children. Um, and there's a lot of legalities and all that. But frankly, I am beyond the legalities. Yeah. You're not going to you're not going to work within the framework of legalities for much longer. Yeah, and, and you can take this as a word from the Lord. This is what is happening today. Yeah. I can see it clear as a bell. So rather than send your kids to school, the teachers need to rise up out of the body. The farmers need to rise up out of the body. The ranchers need to rise up out of the body. The the medical profession needs to rise up out of the body. And, and I believe this is the future for the church. Um, and, and so I think every person needs to be saying, well, what, what am I? Well, maybe you're a seamstress. Listen, you're not going to be able to buy clothing. All of a sudden, a seamstress becomes a very essential uh, part of your subculture. So I think that we need to... Uh, really start looking at that. Uh, you know, the builders, uh, every profession has something to bring to the table. And, and Israel has, has origin, originally lived on this principle of the kibbutz. Yeah. And that's what a kibbutz is all about. Everybody brings what they have to the table. Yes. Yeah. So I think we can start looking towards that end uh, that's not going to happen overnight, and uh, most people, many people, are going to have a hard time breaking away from the system. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good word. We don't have to start a school. No. We can have a place where a school can, where homeschoolers can meet there, just like they do at Lake Gregory. They well, that would be like. They don't have yeah, a school, but it's, yeah. but they, it's still yeah. under state office. Yeah. De Deanna was saying we don't have to start a school. We could just see, have a place here where the homeschoolers can meet, yeah. you know, but we still are, there's still things that have to be done, you know, and if somebody gets wind of that, that, hey, we're homeschooling here, they're going to want to pull their children out of public school and bring them here, especially when, as uh, Pastor Bruce was sharing, it's an agenda, yeah. you know, and, it, and it's an evil agenda. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so let's, let's go on. You know, there, there are many rabbis that believe that the section that we're reading, it's only for the land of Israel. You cannot take this out of Israel. That, you know, so for 2,000 years, there, you know, there, there's no place to, uh, to take their uh, bikurim. You know, uh, they don't... Convenient. Oh, it's convenient. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and they don't, you know, they could, they could take it right to the synagogue. They could take it, you know, to the church, a, a messianic church uh, that we are, you know, uh, you know, you, we could, we wave it here. When we have our uh, Shavuot service, we, we wave our, our, our first fruit uh, offering. So, uh, you know, spiritually, uh, I think everything we can take, because if you're grafted into Israel, which we are, uh, you know, all the laws also apply to us. So uh, that's I, kind of a problem. That's what the yeah, you know, and that's what the rabbis want to see. They want to <laughs> they want it to, you know, it, it's only for for the Jew and no one else, you know. But here in these uh, Torah portion, we're going to see it's even for the sojourner, for the person that attaches himself to Israel. You know, but even today, many believers bring their, their first fruit offering 
every year and they give uh, uh, they give thanks, you know, and, and we do that. We we thank the Lord for what He has given us. I don't think it's a it, it, it's a problem to uh, when you receive something, thank the Lord and and uh, and give an give an offering. Okay, go ahead, Pastor Paul, and then I'll move on. Okay. Uh, just talking about this portion in regards to tithes uh -huh. and we bringing our offerings and so on and so forth. It's very hard to read this portion of scripture and ignore the fact that every third year, every third year, the tithe yeah. did not go to the church; it went to the poor. Right. And you know, we say, "Well, we are observant." Uh, uh, no, we're not. <laughs> well, we, we do the the dark yeah. It's yeah. not the same. <laughs> it's the same principle. It's just I think it's the same, same principle. Action. Uh, I, we can save our sadaka for three years and then give it away. Right. But, yeah, we okay. don't, and we don't want to do that because if we did that, all those that are in need at that time, they're not going to be able to receive. We gave all the well, we see, that's the that's church. the difference about <laughs> how God set His thing up. Mm -hmm. You know, He set it up, and it is it's not that difficult. It's pretty clear that no matter what, everything, because see, we we take a tithe and then we people give offerings. Yes. And I give offerings. I, I do that. But at the same time, the tithe far exceeds the offerings that are given. So if indeed all of the tithe went to the poor, in other words, that year they would be taken care of because it would, you know, it's not like the treasury kept the money and gave mm -hmm. it as it was needed. You, you know, you can't just give people a whole bunch of money and expect it to last for three years, uh, <laughs> or even for one year. Uh, you know, most people will go out and buy a brand new donkey right away. <laughs> then they have no money for food. So, but I'm just saying, you know, when we look at this and you start putting it in line, yeah, this we are far away from doing this particular right. thing. Right. I mean, yeah. We do appease ourselves by going, well, we do give sadaka, and that's good. The Jewish community is still doing the same thing. Every time we have in the fall, what are we having? Yeah. The, uh, uh, where they're raising money on TV, you know, charity, charity, give right. charity, you know. And are they uh, doing what scripture says exactly? I don't think so. You know, there's so much, even this congregation, I remember years ago, in fact, I think it was Deanna that headed it up, when uh, when uh, <laughs> when there was a, a, a group that there was like a million coins or something like that, there was, and they were collecting this. You want to know who gave them the most coins of any organization out there? Shiloh. We did. Everybody here in Shiloh, we we drove out there and we just and it was twice the. Huh? Because and it was so heavy. It yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, we gave them so much coins. In fact, I think they wanted to honor us, but we it was just on a day that we. It was we, on the same day that we were doing. What was it, immersion or something? Was it well, maybe it was March of Remembrance. But they wanted to honor us because they did not. And this is a Jewish. Uh, uh, was what was the, it called? It was the same one that had the mortuary. Yeah, but but this was a this was an organ a Jewish organization that put this out to all the Jewish congregations, all the synagogues out there. But the most they received was from this little 63, messy... 63,000 coins. 63,000 coins wow. from Shiloh up here on the mountain. They said, who are you? Yeah, yeah. We wow. have to explain. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but you know, uh, we, we bring in an offering like that. We give, you know, we'll, we'll do things like that. It may not be uh, what Torah is exactly, but... It, in the spirit, uh, it's right on. So, Sinai. Sinai, yeah. that's right, Sinai. Okay. Go ahead, uh, well, I just have Deanna. a question, and I know that the word says to keep it, does it say keep it for a year? 
Because these were fresh fruits and vegetables, weren't they? So how would they? Well, no, you don't keep it. You're, you're bringing your first fruits up, so and they, so they did it every. I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand how Pastor Paul is saying you save it every three years. You give them every week. You would give it to them, and they save. Well, for the first and third no, season, I don't know. Yeah. Because remember, we're talking about produce. We're talking about yeah, the, no. the, the produce from the ground. Right. So, whether it's, whether it's yeah. you're storing up grain or storing up yeah. whatever. Yeah. We have to realize that they still had a monetary system. Yeah. And so, and to sell produce, sell it to other countries, sell it to other people, you ended up with a financial money situation. So, you could do that. I don't know how they actually did it. Only thing I do know is that in this portion of scripture, mm -hmm. this is very important that God says, you are going to be able to do this. You are to keep my commandments, all of them, and it will not be too hard for you. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how they did it. I, I mean, I, I never studied to find out exactly how right. did they do that. I don't know. Okay, go ahead, Peggy. Uh, and the question is for Pastor Paul, because you say it's a tithe. Was it a separate tithe? Was it a tithe to the poor? Was it the main tithe that they always take? I don't know. What does the scripture say? I don't know. That's why says, I'm asking. So that's why I'm saying there were different tithes. I don't think it called. So to say that, that, you know, we're not giving the whole tithe on the third year, it was a separate tithe is what I'm thinking. And, yes, and I didn't read yeah. the whole thing. You know what? And you're right because it, it says a, a, like a tenth of this and then a tenth of that and then it goes on. So it's a portion of it. Okay. Go, uh, let Sharon, uh, let, what, what well, is it? Well, because time. Here, Sharon. Oh, it came in. And where are you reading from? Hold uh, on. Deuteronomy. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. 26. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. 12? 12, 12, starting yeah. at 12, I believe. The end of the 26 12. Tithes must be taken from crops according to a three-year cycle. Every year, the first tithe is given to the Levite. During the first and second years, Ma'asar Shinai, the second tithe is taken. It has a degree of sanctity and must be eaten in Jerusalem. During the third year, instead of the second tithe, a tithe known as the Ma'asar Ani. So there's a lot of tithes talked right, about here. Right, um, right. And it just goes on and on. And it's very confusing, actually. You well, know, you know what? And you're right, because I know that I have the, the collection from the first Fruits of Zion. Uh -huh. And you're right. I think there's like a list of like about uh, 10 different tithes. Yeah. yeah. Pastor Bruce, were you going to share something? Yeah, I was going to. In my opinion, one of the reasons there's so many tithes listed is because they were an agrarian society. So your apples and your oranges didn't mature at the same time. Right. So you had all these different tithes of first fruits coming in at different times. Now, we're not an agrarian society. Yeah. So, I mean, first off, none of us bring any fruit except on... Uh, Shavuot. Shavuot. And, and that we don't grow. We go down to the store on the way to church and buy it. <laughs> Be, because it's the best we can do. Are you letting our secret out? Yeah. <laughs> Not mine, yours. You know. but, uh, I think we have to understand that, uh, you know, the New America, I think, words it really well. It says, when you, in verse 12, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your increase, in the third year. So the tithe always comes first. The tithe belongs to God, period. And we have to really uh, break down the, the wording here because offerings are different than tithe. Mm -hmm. And then, <coughs> it, then as you bring your offering, it goes to the Levite, to the stranger, to the orphan and the widow. So it goes into the temple to uh, be dispersed out. To be dispersed mm -hmm. out the way it needs to be dispersed. And there's no percentage that goes to the Levite, no percentage goes to the stranger or the orphan or the widow. Yep. It's just all part of this. But it's after you paid your, your, your tithe. 
So also, we're dealing with individuals here. We already made that point that this is the first time God is really speaking to, to individuals, not the whole congregation. So the individual is to pay their tithe, and then that year, uh, if you're going to stick, you know, uh, if you're going to adhere strictly to, to the understanding of it, it has to be this third year, then you're going to give your offerings to the Levite, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So that goes yep. a little bit beyond uh, the Sadaka, although for us the Sadaka covers all four of those things. But if you're going to make it a special offering, then probably what you should do is stop giving your offerings to all the different places where you give offerings now, and in the third year, bring it into the the congregation so it can be dispersed out differently. Right. Yeah. Just a thought. Uh, but we have to, I don't think you can get, I love the scripture, uh, David dying on his bed when he, he, it says he fulfilled all of God's plans for his generation. And I am so big on that. We have to figure out how does this work for us? us. Yeah. Because much of what we read, even in the Brit Hadashah, it doesn't work for us. It, it's, a, uh, it's an impossible situation to do it the way they did it. Right, yeah, right, right. right, right. Well, you know, I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of issues. You know, I had a conversation with a, a member, a former member of this congregation. Uh, uh, what happened is uh, he stated, uh, why do we give to other people when there's a need in this congregation. And he said, you shouldn't be giving the money out away or it should always stay right here. And this is what I told him. I said, to the stranger. Mm -hmm. I said, so if there's a need out there, we've sent money before out to, you know, uh, to other people that are in need. You know, uh, that's just, uh, you know, I think I think we have a very good, uh, the person that's involved with a lot of our, our giving or the people that are involved, you need to understand, you know, they pray about this. They seek the Lord. And then, it, and then when it goes out, once you know it, that many times we get a praise report back that, I needed this, how did you know? And I, you know, so it's... Uh, I, I think the, the people that are involved are doing a very good job of uh, distributing uh, the sadaka. So go ahead, uh, Gary. To touch on a lot of what Pastor Bruce is saying, um, there's a lot that we can do. Just go back a year uh -huh. on the issue of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. But, okay, you know, there's different ways that without using toilet paper, but when it comes down to food, that option doesn't exist. You know, with the COVID stuff coming up, the vaccines, the universal income, the Great Reset, everything in our grocery stores, grocery stores has an average of 24 to 48 hours inventory as far as how it moves. Right. And most everything that comes to a grocery store is well over 100 miles away from its origin point. Mm -hmm. If that transportation hub stops, our stores are cleared out within three days. Mm -hmm. How much food do we have at home? How long are you going to last? Then you are becoming hungry. Then you are going out looking for food then you, you can follow the sequential events to where it ends up, okay? When that happens, oh, we're gonna go plant some fruits and vegetables and this, that, or whatever now. It's gonna take months. Okay, we started doing trees quite a while ago, several years ago. They're just now starting to really come into their own. That's three, four years, Yeah. okay, to get to this point. Are you gonna just do a three, four, five, Five year fast and wait till uh, what, I, what I'm saying is we see the writing on the wall that's obvious okay they're getting ready to start doing the universal income 
People are staying home. They are not working. Mm -hmm. right. They're getting money from the government. Okay, if we're getting money from the government, we are staying home. Why don't we start doing something with it? Mm -hmm. We can start buying land. We can start. Now, there is a major learning curve to growing fruit, to growing vegetables, how to produce them, how to harvest. We're not doing that. We're not learning that. And we're just sitting back, do 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 while the rest of the world is smart. Our enemy is smart. When you're talking about the education stuff, okay? Think about the, the good seed, the bad seed, the wheat and the tear. Go back to the founding of this country. Yes, let the good um, spiritual people grow with the ones with a hidden agenda. Let them grow together. But then yeah. the tares start slowly overcoming the wheat. Yeah. They start choking it out. That's what's happening now. Uh -huh. yeah. Using Bruce's example, okay? We need to start coming together and forming pockets of the wheat and keep the tares out. Yeah. But we're not doing that. We're just sitting here. We're going on week after week, week, month after month, year after year, with our heads in the sand, yeah. thinking it's all going to go away, pretending it's going to pass us by, and it's not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like I see this vision in my head. Noah's up on the hill saying, you know, guys, it's going to rain. It's going to rain soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. But once that door closes... There's nobody else getting on the ark. Yeah. That's a good analogy. And I see the clouds coming. Here, let let Peggy go first. No, it's the uh, tent. Okay. Tent. Do you want to unmute him and let him I, speak? Can you hear me? Yeah, I could hear you. Right. Uh, well, what, what they're doing now with the education here in our country uh, is they're trying to discredit our founding fathers. Yeah. That would mean this is going to be banned, right? Oh yeah, you absolutely. This is and when this is banned, uh, the United States. So when your kids, when your kids or grandkids come back to you from public school and start arguing with you that this is evil, uh, you'll know the time has come. You know. Yeah, exactly. I think the time is here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Kent. You're, you're absolutely right. You're right. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, um, Debbie? Julia said she could outgrow the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm moving to Cala Mesa where uh, Julia and George are. So <laughs> go ahead, uh, Deanna. Well, I just, my thought with um, when Gary said that, that we get out the tares and the wheat to mm -hmm. separate, but. The Lord also says the harvest is right. The workers are few. So now's the time, I think, that we have to be really evangelizing and telling people because uh -huh. we can't just be concerned about ourselves. That's not the way he wants us to be. He wants us to go out and tell others because the time is when people are going to want hope and they don't see it in the world. They're going to want hope in, yes. in, a, in a salvation, yep. in a Savior. Yeah. No. Go ahead and hand it to uh, Sharon. <laughs> Sharon first, uh, Pastor Paul or Bill, let me have it. Here's an analogy for you. <laughs> Against the wind. Well, for the last couple of years, the Lord has been putting on Bill and I's heart just to um, buy really good seed, heirloom seeds, non-GMO. And there's a place up in uh, Sonoma, which we're up there quite a bit, that sells these seeds. So we've been kind of stockpiling them, um, mostly the kind that uh, builds into doing microgreens, which produce um, within a week. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we have a lot of those seeds. So, and I think everybody can do stuff like that. If you don't have a whole lot of land that you can't, you know, plant a bunch of trees or plant a big garden, 
you can certainly do microgreens mm -hmm. and uh, you won't starve. Right. You know, it has all the nutrients of a full plant in these very small microgreens. And you just grow them in? In trays. In trays. Uh-huh, in front of a sunny window. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, that, that's something for people to think about that really don't have a lot of space. Go ahead, Pastor Paul. Well, a few years ago, we promoted all this kind of stuff. Yes, I remember. Getting seeds, doing all of that, storing up water. We, we went through the whole thing. Of course, then nothing happened. So, it, with even with the water barrels, I, they were, when I had, I got probably 20 barrels. Wow. But, <laughs> but, well, I know, but people came to me and gave me their barrels back because they just decided, well, I'm, I'm not doing this. Yeah. So they just, you know, gave me barrels. So, I, mm -hmm. you know, the $50 barrels they paid for, you know, the ones with the spigot, I never bought any of those. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, I had other barrels. Yeah. So, and now I have four of those barrels. People yeah. just, you know. And we, all use, and we all use them at Suco to hold the tents yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay, one of the things that's going on, obviously, when you talked about the 13 states. I didn't, I've never heard that before, but that's yeah. very interesting. Uh, but you do realize that President Biden has uh, put out an executive order for all of the national lands, BLM lands, to expand 30%. Oh, really? Well, what that means is that if you live close to close by, government yeah. land, you, your land becomes their, their land. land. Yep. And oh, yeah. see, the reason why that the government's doing that, and the same thing with Bill Gates buying up all yes. the farmland and all that stuff, it literally is to control. I mean, that statement, you shall own nothing and be happy, yeah. is really the undergirding agenda that's being promoted, right? And it's not going away, and you know, for me, I'm thinking, tell me what the other state, tell me what the states are where everybody's going to be, because I'm going to be. Oh, in the I want to be in the other. <laughs> the what is that? The the other 37. Yeah, yeah. Except, uh, you know, it's. It, I was going to say except Hawaii, and the reason I was going to say that is my daughter just went there, and she said that. It's not what everybody thinks it is, you know, and um, you know, it, it, she said it was much like L.A. within the big city. You know, she went within one of the big cities. She said, I could have seen all this homelessness in L.A. You know, people just camped out, but it's a very liberal. Hawaii is very liberal. So, go ahead, uh, Tila. Also, um, not only with with uh, everyone's talking about seeds and growing this and that. I took a course. It was a number of years ago uh, with the forestry, and you'd be surprised with all the edible plants and things that are out here. I made yeah. nettle soup. I made nettle soup out of nettles. You know, yeah. the, the kind that sting your leg. Yeah. Okay. I made I made nettle soup, and it's supposed to be full of vitamin C. So there's a lot of things that we just don't we just don't pursue the knowledge of what is around us. You're because right. like this one forest ranger said, he said you have a family. He goes, if you don't start preparing them now on what to eat. They won't eat it. The little kids, you know, little yeah. kids would rather eat a Twinkie than yeah. eat yeah. nettle soup. So there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other knowledge that we have out there that we're not taking advantage of. And you know, you're absolutely right, Tila. Peggy and I went to the Grand Canyon and we took a tour. And our tour guide took us through the the national park and the you know where where all the deer and everything were at. And he's showing us every single tree that the Indian would get their food from, how they, the bushes, how they would use the bush to knit uh, their clothing and stuff like that and baskets. And, and so there, you're right, there's just so much out there that we, we, don't know. we just don't know. We just don't know. Okay, let me, move, let me move on. The rest of chapter 26 covers the tithe and encourages the Israelites to keep God's commandments. The Israelites are God's treasure uh, possession. And if they keep God's commandments, God will set them high above all the nations. And that's what we read there. They're going to be set high 
and above. They're not going to be like, they're not supposed to be like the nations. Right. You know, the nations are corrupt. They're, uh, they're uh, evil. They, uh, they, you know, there's a, a abortion and uh, there's just so much going on. While well, his treasured possession is better than that, you know. So in uh, letter C of Roman numeral one, the tithe and offerings, we are encouraged to keep God's commandments. Okay, and then in uh, Roman numeral two, we're going to talk about blessings and curses. And let's see if we can get through all this within a half hour. <laughs> okay, in chapter 27 and 28, they are uh, the blessing and curses chapter. Chapters. Uh, Moses tells the Israelites to build an altar on Mount Ebal. And they are to coat it with uh, plaster and write God's uh, commandments uh, on the altar. The altar could not be made of cut stones. They had to use only uncut stones. In other words, just natural rocks that you didn't uh, chisel away to see if it'll fit in perfectly. Uh, they weren't used. You had to just get uncut stones. Mount Ebal is near the city of Shechem. Shechem is, to believe about, is believed to be right around 4,000 years old. And, uh, and you might think, well, whoa, that must be one of the, or that has to be the oldest uh, town or whatever uh, in the world. No, it's not. It's not even in the top 10. So that tells you there's a lot more uh, places that are much older. Uh, Jericho is older than uh, Shechem. Abraham built an altar in Shechem, and that's in Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Okay, so in number one of Roman numeral two, Moses instructs the people to set up 12 stones. So instructs and 12 are the fill-ins. And then in number two, Torah is written on the uncut stones. Okay, now we're going to uh, move on. Moses... Uh, now instructs the tribes to into two groups, half on Mount Ebal and half on Mount Gerizim. Uh, the, and then if you want to just write this down or if, or if you want to look it up yourselves, uh, the tribes that were going to be on the Mount Ebal were Reuben, the tribe of Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. Those were the tribes on Mount Ebal. And then on the tribes of Mount Gerizim were Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And it was God who chose uh, what tribe was going to be on each mountain. So I know in the past people have come up, well, why did he pick this, these tribes on this mountain? Why did he pick the tribes on, uh, on the other mountain? I couldn't find anything that is written as to why certain tribes were on one mountain and certain tribes were on the other. So this is one of those where only God knows why. Or maybe there isn't even a reason why. He just picked them and put, placed them there and said, these, this is where you're going to be. Uh, during Yeshua's time on earth, he fulfilled everything that he was sent to do. I like what Pastor Bruce shared earlier about David, who in his lifetime, he fulfilled everything that he was supposed to do. Uh, you know, we even read in Torah where Moses said, uh, this isn't hard for you. You know, you can keep the Torah. Uh, but... Uh, the complete Jewish Bible is more accurate when it says that Yeshua did not come to abolish the Torah, but to fulfill it. There are many Christian pastors and commentators that believe Deuteronomy 28 does not apply to us anymore. Uh, that it, it doesn't apply for today. That all the curses in Deuteronomy 28 were dealt with at the cross. Um, but our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, I realize that uh, 
he accomplished uh, much on the, on the cross. But to think that uh, you can sin and just uh, gleefully just say, oh, it's, it, it's taken care of. I said, I'm sorry. You know, uh, maybe it's just the attitude of the heart or, but, uh, you know, I think Deuteronomy 28 does apply to us today just as it did, you know, 3,500 years ago. <clears throat> you know, when Moses was speaking on the, on the east side of the Jordan. And what is blessing? Uh, blessing is uh, from uh, Webster himself is approval uh, or encouragement. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, I read, I read uh, in a book about blessing and it said it this way, that blessing uh, is defined as life with God resulting in fullness and abundance. Yeah. Life with God. That was you know? Webster? No, that wasn't oh. from Webster. <laughs> no, I read that in a book. Oh, okay. The person was, the person herself, it was, a, it was a lady. It'd have to be a lady, a man, you know. I mean, <laughs> ladies are more brilliant with. <laughs> they're more spiritual, you know, so... Yeah, so uh, here in verses 1 through 14 in, of chapter 27, God tells Moses that he will bless the people only if, like uh, somebody was saying, how many times did he say that? I will bless you only if you obey me, only if you keep my commandments. You know, it just goes on and on. Okay, and number 3, Mount Gerizim, was the mountain set up for blessings. And that's your fill-in, blessings. Mount Ebal curses. You know the Mount Ebal faces Tel Aviv? It faces Tel Aviv? Yeah, it's the one on the north side uh -huh. facing toward Tel Aviv. Oh, wow. And that's a Mount Ebal. You know, I bet you we could, there's probably a lot of uh, spiritual significance with with each mountain, you know, um, and, uh, and you know, I'm not surprised with the way uh, uh, Tel Aviv is, you know, what is it, <laughs> what, the, the gay capital of the world now? Jeez, you know, uh, but uh, the Lord is promising his children that they would be the greatest of all the people on earth, that they would be high and lifted up. Remember, God earlier called the same people his special treasure, uh, his segula, in Exodus 19.5 and in Deuteronomy 7.6. Uh, but, like we said, and we'll say it again, they had to obey his instructions. You know, uh, we say, you know, we could say it, that's all you had to do was obey his, obey his instructions. Well, I remember one time, you know, getting a nice little spanking, and all I had to do was obey my <laughs> parents' instructions, you know, and you know, and and I failed to do it. So, so it's not e it's easier said than done. Go ahead, Tila. Well, in in verse, uh, I want to understand this. In verse twelve and thirteen, he said these tribes uh, were to bless to bless the people, and the other one on Mount uh, Ebal to curse. Now, how would you like to be in that position? Are they listening to God? Who are they cursing? And who are they blessing? Well, you know is what? That a, is that a position? No, it was a combined effort. Yes, one, uh, they would say, uh, uh, you know, the, they, would, they would announce a curse, like, curse is the man who makes an idol or molten image and, or is an abomination. All of them in, uh, in unison would say, Amen or Amen, you know. So it wasn't like one directed to the other and the other one directed. It was something, yes, they were saying it, but they were all in agree agreement. You know, don't do this. Curse is the person. There's uh, many rabbis that think that these aren't really curses, that they're all blessings because you're saying it as a curse, but... The opposite of that is you will be blessed if you don't do this. Exactly. No, Go ahead, Sharon. My point exactly. It's like you stay away. And there's 
there's 12, one from each tribe, of curses. Um, and it says, if you follow the commands I give you this day, so yes. it's specifically um, referring to these these commands, yes. these curses. Um, and in my mind, it's like, if you follow the 10 and these, these pretty much are like broad areas. Yes. Um, and if you keep them, the blessings of God are going to come. They're going to come. They're going to come because yep. I, I don't think anything can stop them. Yep. Because if you don't do these, God's blessings will chase you down. Yes, yes. So uh, as, as far as it like being directed, uh, um, it's not directed to, I know we we're talking about this is the first time when the individual now has to do, do something. The curse, the curse is basically, it's a, they're speaking it as a curse, but it's actually a blessing. Don't, if you don't do this, you are going to be blessed. And it's just going to track you down and just overpower you all his blessings. So, uh, you know, and there's one section, I think it's back in, is it back in uh, Deuteronomy where it's like, uh, 40, something like, uh, I think it's like 49 curses, and then now, or in Leviticus, and 49 curses. And then here they say all the curses, if you add up all the, the curses, it doubles. It's like 98, mm -hmm. you know. So what's with that, you know? It's, uh, <clears throat> but uh, if we take this as a, uh, all of them as blessings, Boy, there's a ton of blessings there for those who keep God's commandments. Here we're saying it again. Just obey the Lord. You know, the Israelites were a set-apart people, holy. They were not like any other nation. Uh, these blessings that God is promising them, you know, has, but they have strings attached. They were conditional. You do this, and I'll do that. Uh, uh, these were wonderful blessings that God uh, was going to pour out on his people, but only if, again, they kept his commandments. So let's, uh, you know, and, and, and then number four, in a way, this was like giving and accepting of Torah that took place on Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Giving and accepting. There were, there were many in this group that were born in the desert or they were maybe children that uh, they didn't remember what took place on Mount Sinai. And uh, a lot of the adults, well, the adults at that time, uh, they have already died in the, in the wilderness. So you had a new uh, people group here, basically, and if it was about 600,000 men, uh, there was a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's like giving of the Torah once again. All right. Um, let's see. And as we talked about in number five, uh, failing to perform God's commandments will eventually bring about curses. So failing and curses are the two fill-ins. You know, when we start reading uh, how God will, would bless the people, we read that there are three uh, areas that God will bless them if they walk in his ways. One was uh, military success. You know, uh, you can include uh, even financial prosperity. We saw this right away when we read uh, of all the victories, you know, after they entered the land. They were given many victories. And you know that every single battle, uh, yeah, the, the, the people would go in there and fight, but every single battle, God was going to bring them victory. It was, they didn't have to rely on their skills. It was the Lord that was going to give them their, their victory. You know, we see that with the, as mighty as the walls of Jericho were, the Israelites were successful in knocking them down and defeating them. Uh, I was teaching the, the children this week, and, and uh, we were talking about the walls of Jericho. You know, the walls, uh, 
you know, we, we play with these little blocks, these cardboard blocks, and we build them up, and then the kids go and they knock it down, you know. Well, you know, what I was explaining to them, the uh, Jericho, the walls were, you know, 20, 30 feet wide. You had homes on top of the, built into the walls, on top of the walls. You know, you had armies that were able to march back and forth on these walls. They were strong. So it's not like just uh, the people, people let up a shout and the walls came tumbling down, you know. <laughs> I mean, that had to be an enormous uh, type of uh, sound or, you know, that the Lord just destroyed these walls. In other words, what I was telling the kids was it wasn't an earthquake or, or I mean, he could have supplied it, uh, the Lord. But it was the Lord that brought down that wall. You're not going to bring down a thick wall like that, you know, uh, by blowing the shofar unless God did it, you know. So God was definitely involved. So, like I said, the walls were very thick. <clears throat> you know, the spoils of Jericho, who, where, who received the spoils of Jericho? Does anybody remember? God. So, yeah, like Pastor Paul said, God. God, that was the first battle, the first spoils, they go to the Lord. Yeah, one person blew it. <laughs> go ahead, Sharon. <clears throat> um, just going back to the curses and the uh -huh. blessings, um, they were definitely for the nation of Israel, but they were also for in the individual specifically. Yes. And my question is, I think, is, you know, if you have a group of strong, strong people that um, follow the commands, but you have a nation that has mostly fallen away from God, and in fact, are kind of gnashing their teeth at God, um, which way are you going to, you know, which way is the nation going to go? Is it still going to receive the blessings because of the committed people within that country, or no? No. No, that's very interesting because uh, you know what do they what do they say? It rains on the unrighteous, just like the righteous. So uh, you're right. Our, you know we're going to be, you know, if 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 there's going to be a terrible storm that's going to hit this country it's going to affect all of us except I lean on how he's going to protect us as we go through it the individual who loves the Lord go ahead Pastor yeah. Paul well the deal about Israel has nothing to do with Israel it has everything to do with God's promise to them yeah that is the baseline as to why they will survive <laughs> Uh, obviously, I mean, when you reject Yeshua and just about all the Jewish community, I don't care where they are, what they are, have rejected Yeshua as Messiah. When you reject him and he says the only way to the Father is yeah. through me, yeah. uh, there is no way for them except for God had made a promise personally to them that I will never forsake or leave you. And he's faithful, remember, even when we're not. So that's the baseline as to why Israel has hope. Now, <laughs> along with that, we've joined ourselves to Israel. Uh, we receive Yeshua as our Messiah. Our difficulty is doing the things that God said that we ought to be doing according to Torah. Mm -hmm. You know, because like in America, when we think, oh, we're a Christian country, and then you go back and you begin to realize, well, wait, maybe, <laughs> maybe we're not as Christian as we thought. You know, we grew up in a Christian culture. Right. That's why for us, our social studies and all of that stuff, it was it was much more yes. right because it was a Christian background culture, but that's gone. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, we start looking at this stuff and what the future holds. Uh, for you and I, it's the same thing. God has made a covenant agreement with Israel since we're adapted into them 
And right. we receive that blessing that he won't leave or forsake us either. They rejected Messiah. For the most part, Christianity has rejected Torah. So, you know, you, you, you aren't going to make it with either with missing either one of those things. Right. So it's by the grace of God. I mean, we just have to realize. Yeah. Yeah. His, his decision. You know, and then uh, I was going to share. You know, there's also uh, when we talk about the, uh, the the blessing, the three areas: prosperity in farming and family. There's going to be a blessing there. Uh, they were to be a testimony to all the nations on earth. Deuteronomy 27, uh, 28, 7 speaks of how God will protect his people. It says, when nations rise up against you, you know, just as today where there are many nations surrounding Israel, it was the same back in biblical times. Uh, so just like, and just like today, there are people that are jealous of Israel. Nations were jealous of Israel back in ancient times too because God was blessing them. Uh, there have been many battles in Israel's history uh, that the only explanation of why they won is God was with them. Uh, going back to Jericho, to Gideon, and even to the 1967 war, God has been there uh uh, to fight for Israel. God swore that Israel would be blessed and God does not go back on his word. If anyone is going to blow this arrangement, it's not going to be God. It's going to be the people. So go ahead, uh, Gary. Yesterday, we went out to lunch with Doug and Carol and this guy walks up, he sees my hat and he says, are you from Israel? I know we've been there a couple of times. He was a military black ops type liaison in uh -huh. Israel during the 60, uh, 73 wow. war. Oh my gosh. Uh, in northern Israel by Syria. This is what he told me happened. The tanks were coming in from Syria and Israel knew they were going to lose. They were being told, you either get out of the country or get into an Israeli uniform, or you're going to be a shot as a spy. They were expecting to lose. He was with Moshe Dayan. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Okay. And all of a sudden, this IDF soldier comes barging into the planning meeting and looks at the map. And he says, the Syrians are here and here. You need to move your column up this way and around this way. You'll encircle them and you'll win. He said the guy's uniform was Israeli, but it was different. It had different patches and stuff on it. And he said he turned around and walked out. And then they went out to go get him. IDF soldier was standing outside. They said, where was that soldier that just came in here? He says, no soldier came in here. No one has come in, no one has come out. And then they came back in and they said, you do the plan. And they won. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Only with God. Yeah. Yeah. This guy just came up to us out of the blue at the restaurant yesterday. And shared that with you. I don't know why I'm getting these little... Uh, <laughs> uh, but okay. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to top that, uh, Gary. But <laughs> Leviticus 20.26 20, says this about how God loves his people. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the, from the peoples to be mine. God did not say that about any other people group, only Israel. And I like what it says in Zechariah 8.23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from all the nations will grab the garment of a Jew and saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. We are grafted into Israel. We are able to claim all these, uh, all that God has promised Israel. If we only obey God, and there we are again. <laughs> the rest of the Middle East can truly know and receive what their cousins have if they embrace the God of Israel. The problem is they want nothing to do with Israel's God. You know, our country has been blessed uh, 
because we have embraced the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but how long will that continue? You know, and I think uh, Sharon said it really good when uh, now, you know, uh, we're a people group or a nation, you know, which is not uh, following the Lord, you know, as, as a whole. Um, are we going to be uh, punished as a whole or is he only going to punish those who don't love him? I hope he just punishes those who don't love him, but I don't know. He never you know. does that. Yeah, he never did. Yeah, exactly. So in verses 15 through 68, the curses are outlined. The people are warned as to what will happen to them if they're disobedient. All the promises listed in 1 through 14, uh, they, they will stop. The, they stop because of not obeying God, so now they are under a curse. Everyone, who, everyone loves to hear about the blessings of God, but when it comes to the curses, no one wants to hear that, you know. Uh, so <clears throat> we are encouraged to focus on the prize that awaits at the finish line. Yeshua uh, completed the race, and he is our example. Uh, Moses, the most humble man ever, completed the race. You know, Paul, who used to hate the followers of the way, became a follower of Yeshua, and he too completed the race. You know, if we de decide to quit following the Lord, uh, then what type of reward will there be for us at the finish line? You know, I, I would hate to find out, you know, but there is a, a lot of people out there that they do not want to follow the Lord. And a lot of them, unfortunately, are politicians. So, uh, you know, I wanted to share this. Uh, you know, I've shared this before <clears throat> in another study, uh, how, it was pos how would it be possible for a, a population that had at least 600,000 men uh, to hear the reading of the Torah uh, between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, you know, and then everyone hollered, Amen. Okay, but then uh, I read in an article, and you can write this down, it's on BiblePlaces.com. BiblePlaces.com. And it referred to an experiment that was conducted in the 19th century by J.W. McCarvey. Uh, uh, and it was, you know, during his tour of the Holy Land. He describes how these two mountains faced each other with their slopes being about one mile apart. And you think that one mile apart, how could you be on one mountain and, uh, and holler or, or, or speak and then somebody can hear you? You know, we're, we're, our, our uh, mindset is, is today, you know, but... Uh, with, uh, you know, with the biblical uh, city of Shechem lying between them. On the side of both mountains, there is a deep semicircular recess, okay, which forms two natural amphitheaters where voices can carry for a considerable long distance, okay. For his experiment, McCarvey stood between the two mountains. So he stood between the two mountains in a place where the Levites and the people of Israel would have, would have stood. Okay, uh, he said there was enough room there to, to uh, fit over 600,000 people and, uh, and their families. Uh, he also goes on that one of his two companions climbed halfway up Mount Ebal. The other one climbed halfway up Mount Gerizim. Each evidently stood within the two natural amphitheater, amphitheaters where they could each rep, uh, represent the six tribes that would have been on each side. And then what happened is uh, they started reading the blessings and the curses. And his two com companions, after they would read the, the, the blessing and the curses, he would read the blessings and the curses, and the two men responded, Amen. When, when he completed it. 
The, mount, the person that was on Mount, he, he writes that the person on Mount Gerizim could hear the author clearly, and his response could also be heard clearly. The companion that was on Mount Ebal could hear the voice of the person down uh, in the valley uh, speaking, but he had difficulty hearing the words from the person on the other side because of all the trees that have grown over the years. He said, but he, he just, he could hear, he just couldn't make it out, okay? Um, and it affected the, the acoustics. McGarvey suggested that if Joshua had a loud voice, he could have easily been heard by all the people of Israel, even without the Levites repeating the words. So this is a study that was done back in the 19th century. Today it's probably impossible with all the walls and homes and everything, traffic and everything else that's going on. But in the 19th century, when this person did this study, this is what they found out. So, so what it says in your Bible is exactly the way it was done. The experiment shows that God chose the best place in the land to conduct this ceremony of renewal of his covenant. So all the congregation of Israel uh, could hear the words of the law clearly and agree to them. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to share that again. So in Roman numeral three, we move on to Netzavim, which means standing, and that's your fill-in, standing. Netzavim means standing, and it's taken from the, the first verse where it says, you stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God. Mo, you know, Moses is continuing his last speech uh, to the people. And, uh, and he's going he's gonna to go on and, and finish. Uh, we still have three uh, chapters to go. But, uh, but he, he's going to go on. I'm going to give you uh, Roman, I mean, number one, God is God makes a new covenant with the Israelites who are entering the promised land. And what and what is this new covenant now? He's telling them that, you know, I am your God and you are my people. And uh, and even though he's going to speak to Moses and let Moses know that at a future time that they are going to fail and they're going to fail miserably and he is going to punish them uh, harshly, he will still not give up on them. They are still his people. And in this covenant, he is he's going to tell them that this is not only for you, but the word tells us that it is for the future generations. So here it is, people that are, are not even born yet, in fact, let me see where, where it says that. In uh, chapter 30, so it shall be written, so it, sh so it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart, soul, according to all I command you, today you and your sons. Then, the, then he goes on, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all, all the people of the Lord uh, God has scattered you. And uh, I, let me see, because he does tell them that, uh, here it is. He says, uh, now it is not with you alone that I am making this covenant and this oath, but both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. Amen. He is speaking uh, generations later to all the people that if you accept me, uh, then you are mine and all this is, you know, Rashi explains that Moses is, refer is referring to future generation. This invitation is for everyone who had not been born yet. Go ahead, Sharon. Well, I, this should automatically um, tell us that 
tell everybody, what was the last prayer of Yeshua? Yeah. And didn't he say these exact words? Yes. Not only for you, but for those who are not here, have not been born. Yeah. And um, I've been, I wouldn't say this to anybody, but I've been wondering about our soul and whether the soul was created with every other spiritual being a long time, well, in our, yeah. you know, we're in, we're in time and space, so to us it's a long time ago. But um, here the sages say that all Jewish souls were present at, at this declaration. Um, and were all the souls created at the same time as like all the spirits were created? And, you know, as life progresses, yeah, and just brought forth mm -hmm. when the Lord decided yeah. to, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and I, I, I'm not talking about, um, what, what, what's it called, second incarnations, you know, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. Um, but just I've just been uh, really thinking about that and yeah. asking God to give me wisdom. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give the last ones right now, Tila. Uh, in number one, God makes a new covenant with the Israelites who are entering the promised land. So the fill-in is covenant. Okay, uh, in number two, God may discipline his people, but he will never abandon them. Amen. Uh, God may discipline his people, but he will never abandon them. And then in number three, God sets life and death before us. Choose life, blessings. How many times do you know we read that? Choose life. Uh, and then in number four, Moses teaches us to love and obey God. All this is in verses uh, in chapters uh, uh, 29 and 30. Uh, and it's recorded in Deuteronomy 30. This day I call on heaven and earth as witness against you, and I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. You know, praise God, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, the Lord is, uh, we serve a wonderful God. You know, uh, if we want to bear fruit, you know, then it calls for us to be obedient. So, amen, amen. So uh, that's the Torah study for today. Everybody have a blessed day.